Let's go ahead with that and open our Bibles to Luke chapter 22, 22nd chapter of Luke's gospel. And uh, I'd like to use our text this morning uh, to prepare our hearts for communion. And uh, we'll do that at the end of the service. We'll talk a little bit more about that then. And if you've read ahead, uh, you understand why this text is uh, the perfect fit for that. Um, But again, uh, if you can, remember to put a bookmark there in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, uh, coming to chapter 22, we we find ourselves here in the final section in Luke's gospel, the the section that really everything we have studied thus far has led to. Uh, We begin this morning Luke's account of the death and resurrection of Christ, what we call the Passion of Christ. Now, not only is where we're at here now the climax of Luke's gospel, but but understand that the material that we have before us uh, for the next number of weeks, this is in fact what the entire Old Testament had been pointing to. Uh, Centuries upon centuries upon centuries of of festivals and observances and prophecies uh, all coming to pointing to and finding their fulfillment now in the death and resurrection of Christ. Understand it is all but impossible uh, to overstate the importance of the events that we have before us. All of Christianity finds at its center uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, The Word of God, the Bible itself, finds its center in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The entire Old Testament points to, rehearses, prepares for it. The Gospels themselves describe it, and and the lion's share of the New Testament is essentially an extended commentary upon what this is all to mean to you and I, to mankind. Now, I think where we need to be a bit careful uh, as we come to this final climactic part of our story here. Uh, is I think we need to be careful to guard against the familiar. What do I mean by that? By that I mean this. We're all familiar with the fact that Jesus is going to be betrayed by Judas, that he is going to then stand trial, that he is going to be severely beaten, that he is going to the cross, that he is going to rise again. So the major plot points in the narrative, uh, you and I, we know how it's going to turn out, don't we? So the suspense has sort of been pulled out of this for you and I. Here's what I want you to appreciate. Here's a a bit of a perspective adjustment going into all of this. At at the very point in the narrative where where we're at in the story, verse 1, chapter 22, nobody really knows what's going to happen. I mean, every single major player in the story, from, from where we're at here, none of these guys know the score. None of these players know the plot line. They they don't know how it's going to turn out with the exception of one, right? The Jewish leaders, they know they want to kill Jesus, all right. But at this point, they have no idea how they're going to do it. The disciples, well, you know, Jesus has said some pretty cryptic things here. Half the time, we don't know what he's talking about. but, But hey, who's going to get the corner office in the kingdom? I mean, we're going to discover in the text this morning, Jesus is going to tell these guys, hey, hey, I'm going to bleed, I'm going to die here, and these guys are going to go, okay, um, but which one of us is the greatest? Understand, none of these guys is up for uh, the Nobel Prize in theology at this point in the narrative. And then you've got Theophilus, right, the Roman official uh, that Luke tells us in chapter 1 that he's writing to. You remember Theophilus, or his parents are there in the delivery room. Uh, the doctor got a look at this kid and handed him over to mom and dad. This is the Theophilus-looking kid I've ever seen, and, and the name just stuck, right? Uh, but this Theophilus guy, we don't know a lot about him. We do know that he was a Roman official. He is no doubt emblematic of a, of a first century Gentile reading Luke's gospel. And, and so this has got to be um, a real page turner for these guys. Well, a scroll turner, I suppose, in those days. But, but they don't know what's happening. It's got to be very exciting. Pilate, Herod, these guys are in town to quell any potential Jewish rebellions here at the Passover. They have no idea how this is going to play out. And so Christ alone here is the only person upon the scene that knows exactly what is going to happen. Now, 
you and I, we might have a handle on the meta narrative. We might have a handle on, on the big picture of how these events are going to unfold. And yet I am telling you, and I'm telling myself here too, man, each and every one of us in this room, look, we have our own set of blind spots. We have our own darkened areas of understanding that the light of the living and active word of God desires to shine its light upon. So if you and I uh, kind of week in and week out for the next couple of weeks, if, if we can go to the Lord prayerfully and, and ask our great God to, to reveal himself in a greater way to us, well, then you and I have a, a wonderfully profitable trek ahead of us, and, and we will know our Lord and Savior uh, quite a bit better than we do today. And I don't know about you, but, but that is very, very exciting to me. So, great, great stuff in front of us here. Exceptional learning is heading in our direction uh, this morning and in the weeks ahead. And, 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 and again, I, I think what is um, just particularly exciting is, is some of the most treasured teaching that we have from the mouth of Christ it comes to Luke and the other gospel writers uh, giving us ringside seats uh, uh, at this table, uh, uh, around this communion Passover table where we're going to have just incredible teaching. So let's guard against familiarity. There is a lot for you and I in the immediate coming, uh, coming weeks. Let us seek uh, to have God continue to reveal himself to you and I through his word, by the agency of his spirit, that we might continue to fan the flame of our delight in him. So let's get after it and go to work now. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 22. Verse 1. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Now, Unleavened Bread was a week-long celebration. Passover would be a one-day celebration that began uh, this week. Uh, verse 2, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were, marked this, afraid of the people. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented, and notice here, mark this, began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them. Uh, also notice, apart from the crowd. All right, now, I think the first thing that we have to do to get our, our minds around all of this is, is set up the scene. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, known as the Passover, uh, was really the Super Bowl, if you will, of the, the three major Jewish feasts. And, and the Passover was instituted by the Lord to commemorate and, and celebrate and remember Israel's deliverance from bondage in Egypt. The irony here, and it is strong, is that all of this activity was pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Israel's de uh, deliverance from bondage in Egypt was a picture of our deliverance from the bondage of sin. For centuries upon centuries upon centuries, uh, these people are sacrificing lambs on the Passover, the animal sacrificial system itself, the idea that innocent blood had to be shed for the remission of sin was pointing to the sacrifice that Christ himself is about to make for all of humanity. Uh, the irony is what these guys have been um, rehearsing now for hundreds upon hundreds of years, it's about to go down within 24 hours. But what we need to understand here, as far as the scene is concerned, is that, that at this time, Jerusalem is overrun with religious pilgrims as this feast is underway. Uh, the historian Josephus tells us uh, his estimate, uh, about two and a half million people were in Jerusalem for this Passover here. And so this is a national holiday for these guys, all right? Uh, this is their 4th of July and Thanksgiving, kind of all wrapped in to one, if that makes sense. Now, notice in verse 2 there, the Jewish leadership, they want to kill Jesus. We, we knew that. There's no new intel for us here, right? But notice it says here they were afraid of the people. Why? Well, the short answer is this is Jerusalem Palooza, and Jesus is the headlining act. 
All right? Uh, understand that Jesus has been very, very busy for the past three years. How many of these people that were there had been personally touched by the life of Christ? This same author, Luke, records Peter's testimony for us in Acts chapter 10, uh, that all Jesus did was go around doing good and healing all of those who were oppressed. Peter ought to know. He was there. So how many of these people, they're there at the scene. Uh, maybe Christ had touched their son. Hey, Hey, you know, you, you healed my son up there in Capernaum, and there he is. I just wanted to say thank you, and I'll multiply that exponentially over three years' time. Now, you also remember when he rode uh, into town uh, on, on Monday of this week on the back of a, a baby donkey. They're laying down palm branches. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Also remember at this time that Jerusalem was about the size of three rivers, all right? Imagine two and a half million people at the water fest, okay? And so understand absolute uh, kind of uh, people pandemonium here, and Jesus is at the very epicenter of it all. Now, that then creates a problem for the Jewish leaders because they just can't go and arrest the guy without the crowd going nuts. They were afraid of the people. Also understand that they understand that Rome has a very heavy military presence in place at the Passover. Uh, there, there are Roman soldiers crawling all over the place here because Passover was the most likely occasion for there to be a kind of patriotic uprising. A patriotic fervor would, would have been at a pitch here. So understand they have no idea how they're going to get Christ. They cannot pull this off publicly without having a riot on their hands. Well, who strolls in upon the scene but the answer to all their problems in walks the snidely guy with the mustache and the black cape, right? Enter Judas Iscariot. Now, uh, Mark's gospel uh, tells us that Judas basically crashed their meeting. Matthew's gospel tells us that Jesus literally said, hey, hey, how much is he worth to you? All right, take a look at this from Matthew. Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. And there I think you and I are given tremendous insight into the heart of Judas's problem. Uh, Ju- Judas settled for 30 pieces, of sil- 30 pieces of silver. Really? I mean, is that all the son of the living God is going to fetch on the open market? 30 stinking pieces of silver. Uh, why didn't the guy hold out for 300 pieces of silver? You've got God in the flesh here. I mean, Joseph's brothers sold him out for 20 pieces way back, way back in Genesis 37. You would think that maybe the, the shekel would appreciate a little bit more than that in 1,800 years, right? Now, we're getting a bit cute there. But seriously, 30 pieces of silver would have been an insult, according to the prophecy back in Zechariah chapter 11, that finds its fulfillment right there, okay? And so I think the insight is this. Judas is holding the Son of God hostage, and what does he settle for? 30 pieces of silver. It was the price of a gourd servant back in Exodus chapter 21. Listen, dial in here. Judas, like many of us to some degree, you you see, he did not know what he had. He did not value what he had. This, this man did not place a high value upon Jesus Christ. And, and because he did not value Christ, because he did not delight in Christ, and, and this is where you dial in, that then opens the door for a person to begin to value and delight in other things that aren't so good. And so we're told there in verse 3 that Satan entered into Judas. What does that mean? I believe it means what it says. Satan entered into Judas. Now, I do not believe from what I see in the pages of Scripture that Satan can enter into the heart of a believer. 1 John 4, 1 Peter 1, 2 Corinthians 5. And so I must then conclude here that Judas was never a believer. Maybe that surprises some of you. Can we, can we find support for that assertion in Scripture? Yeah, clearly I think we can. Take a look at this from John chapter 6. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would 
betray him. Seems pretty clear there. Again, John chapter 13, you've got the foot washing scene going on. Peter's a little gun shy on the foot washing deal. Uh, Jesus, in, in, in some discourse, he says this. Jesus said to him, the one who uh, has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that's why he said not all of you are clean. And then here's the clincher, uh, back to John chapter 6 again. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? I think it's very clear that the scriptures present Judas as never having had his sins cleansed, as, as never experiencing really that saving faith in Christ, which is, of course, why he sells him out here. Now, it is true that in Matthew chapter 27, he will later express a degree of regret, right? But he never repents and instead prefers suicide, hangs himself. So again, I do not believe from what I see in the pages of Scripture that a believer indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God can be possessed of Satan. However, there is little doubt as well in the Word of God that the devil can oppress and influence a believer, that the enemy can entice a person into sin. How does he do that? by parading before you counterfeit pleasures and substitutes to finding your ultimate delight and satisfaction in Christ. Again, when, when you and I as believers are sinning, what are we doing? In those moments, expressing a preference for something other than God, right? That's what sin is. Just call a spade a spade. It's when we are preferring something over our delight in God. Your greatest weapon against sin is to find your delight in the superior treasure of Christ. To value him above all things as most excellent and beautiful and worthy. And we do that through the word of God. All right, so um, Satan enters Judas and the betrayal is on. He's looking for an opportunity. Uh, and absolute, what's absolutely fascinating to me is, is how God is even orchestrating the timing of this betrayal. Notice this very interesting turn of events here in verse 7. Then came uh, the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a, a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, now isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that Jesus seems to be speaking rather cryptically here, right? He doesn't give them a name. He doesn't give them an address. doesn't give them a time. doesn't tell them, hey, I texted this guy. He's going to meet you at the corner of Jehovah and Jireh. Uh, a little humor for you Bible students, right? Uh, uh, but he's just speaking in code, and, and he's just kind of laying this out rather cryptically. Now, why is he doing that? Well, what did we just read in verse 6? That Judas is now on the hunt for an opportunity. And we know from Matthew's gospel that he's already grabbed the cash. He is looking to tell the Jewish uh, he is looking to tell the Jewish power brokers here, all right? I've got him. He's going to be at the corner of Jehovah and Jira at 6:30 sharp. He's going to be staying with a guy in the blue house that wears one red shoe. Now, now that would be some intel, would it not? But he can't very well go back to these guys and say, "You know what? I, I don't know when." I don't know why, but, but some dude's going to be carrying a big jug of Aquafina. I, I, I think there's some connection there. I, they're going to say, dude, you've got to do better than that, or you've got to cough up the cash. That's not what we gave you the shekels for. Now, also understand that Jesus, and this is critical, Jesus does not want this Passover meal to be interrupted. All right? He's going to tell us down in verse 15 in a bit. He's going to say, I have 
earnestly desired uh, to eat this Passover with you. The the King Jimmy says, I have desired with desire. There's a a, a double emphatic there. And and again, some of the things that he's going to say to these guys around this table are some of the most precious teachings that we have of Jesus. John chapter 14, 15, 16, all all of the teaching about the Holy Spirit that's going to come and equip these guys. uh, All of that is going to be spoken around this meal, and Jesus does not want this precious time hijacked by Judas. And so Christ here, very cryptically laying this out for these guys, and, and now the hour has come, verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired, double emphatic, earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is a a reference to the marriage supper of the Lamb, to the messianic banquet, right? Verse 17. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Now, you would be hard-pressed to find a greater expression of eagerness in the pages of the New Testament than what we have described here in verse 15. Uh, Again, a double emphatic. I have earnestly desired. He he actually uses a a kind of Hebrew idiom that comes well in the King James with desire, I have desired. So it's just a fervent, um, tremendous desire. I I have greatly longed to eat this meal with you guys. Now, uh, understand that these guys don't have a clue concerning the significance of just what it is that that is being inaugurated here. Uh, Understand that this supper was ushering in really a a whole new era in human redemption. Uh, uh, Jesus knew this, that that the way that man would now relate to God, uh, the veil is going to be torn. Uh, People are going to now have direct access to God 24-7, right? By faith in the finished work of Christ. This meal here is inaugurating, it is initiating the new covenant. He's going to announce this in a bit. Now, these guys are probably like, hey, man, this is quite a spread. We're going to have a great meal here. They do not yet, they do not as of yet have an understanding of the magnitude of this meal. But wonder with me, would you? What must, you have to imagine, what must have this been like for Christ? Who knew just the enormity of this? I mean, the Bible tells us, uh, 1 Peter 1, Revelation Revelation 13, Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Uh, Understand, this is not plan B here, all right? This is plan A. Jesus, whom Colossians tells us, was the very agent of creation itself. Uh, He alone understands the enormity of this from the conception of the created universe Everything that everything had been leading up to this watershed event right here. All the event that all of creation had been built around, it's all about to go down. Every step in redemptive history from the garden until now has been leading up to this, this kind of crescendo. I, I have eagerly, fervently desired to share this meal. This meal, the one that every other Passover meal prior to this was pointing to and finding its fulfillment in a, what was it like for Christ to just step into the enormity of all of this, having seen it down the tunnel of time long ago. These guys don't get it. Now, one day, and this is the encouraging part for you and I, one day they are going to put this all together. Again, at the moment, they just don't understand the galactic scope of this event. But listen, even though they don't get it, one day they will. They're going to put it all together. They're going to get it. Jesus expresses a similar sentiment to this around the same meal after washing their feet in John's gospel. He says this. 
Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Later you will understand. And and listen, this is my prayer for all of us. You and I, uh, all of us. Look, look, man, we're, we're just at different places in our journey. And sometimes, look, I get it, all right? Sometimes we're, we're going through this stuff and, and we think to ourselves, man, I, I just don't get this. I, I, I'm not grabbing this. This is rushing to me, man. I, I don't understand what to do with this. And, and I don't know what this means in my life today. Look, you just stay on the path of being a student of the Word of God and later you will understand. Later, you will understand. What what am I telling you? None of what we are doing here, any time that you open up that Bible during the week, it is never a waste of your time. Even if you don't get it in the moment, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will bring unto remembrance that which you need in due season. Whatever you are sowing in to your mind and heart, even if you don't get it, it is not a waste of time. The Holy Spirit has a kind of divine recall. Uh, What am I doing? I'm trying to encourage you here. When you're sitting down at home with your Bible, when you're sitting under the teaching of God's Word, man, you just, you just take what the Lord happens to open up to you in that hour. Don't worry about getting everything, man. Don't ever be discouraged by that. Don't ever be discouraged by that. And, and again, what you're not getting, understand, it's not wasted because you don't see it yet. Are you tracking with that? And so, you, and so you stay on the path. As you stay on the path, as you pray for the Spirit to illuminate your understanding over the course of time, God will be revealing himself to you in greater and greater ways. Things that used to be kind of hazy and, and, and misshapen, uh, they will begin to come into focus, and, and you'll begin to see it all just, just beautifully, um, uh, symmetrically, perfectly, how, how it fits in with the rest of it. And, and, and then what's going to happen? Your delight in him will increase. And then what's going to happen? All all that garbage that that used to just grab and consume and and command your attention, uh, you will begin literally losing your appetite for sin. So, man, you need to know that. Please be encouraged. Now, back to this meal here. There were, in fact, a number of these cups that were passed. There, There were, in fact, four of them during the Passover ritual. No small debate, by the way, over which of these cups are in view and the order in which Luke is presenting his his gospel. And we're not going to get into all that here. Two things I want you to notice. Number one, Jesus is saying here in verses 16 and 18, I will neither eat this meal or drink this wine with you again until the physical kingdom of God is established. Again, this is a reference to the messianic banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb that one day all believers will be sharing with Christ in glory. Now, there's a kind of veiled hint uh, in verse 16 there, that this was to be the final Passover meal. I, I will never eat of this again because Christ is now fulfilling all that was looking forward to. And, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, of course, he tells us in Colossians that, that these things were just shadows of the substance who is Christ. Paul is categorically dismissing the necessity for ceremonial law, again, because it all points to and was fulfilled in Christ. Now, does that then mean that we shouldn't sit down and and go through a Passover cedar, you know, that church has put on uh, from time to time to walk through? No, of course not. I think that's an awesome thing to do. I I think it's a very cool thing to do. Much learning uh, and appreciation can can happen and be experienced there. But, But the idea is Christ is now to be our rest. Number two, the second thing that I want you to see here, again, not going through all the details of the cedar, but here's what I really want you to grab onto, is what Christ is now going to do here is he is using the normal elements that would have been involved in the celebration of the Passover meal, all of which um, commemorated different aspects of, of the deliverance of God's people from Egypt, 
Jesus is now going to redefine their meaning. He, he is now going to attribute to these procedures new meaning to these different elements, if that makes sense. Why? Because he is establishing a new covenant, a new testament, as some of the words that you'll see in your translation. And, and so, heads up, what, what we're about to read now, understand, this is the initiating of the new covenant, the inauguration of of the new covenant, where, where these elements will now speak to his immediately pending crucifixion, where his sinless life is going to be given as a sacrifice to initiate what he now calls in verse 20, the new covenant. Mark it now beginning in verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks. Now, um, let, let's pause for a minute. When he had taken some bread and given thanks. You have to understand that between verses 18 and 19, you probably had several hours. Uh, uh, several hours. This would have been a very long meal. And, and this is now after the meal. This is the final piece of bread that was taken after the meal. It's called the aphikomen. And it comes from a word that means he is coming. And so Christ is saying, look, your fathers, your ancestors for hundreds upon hundreds of years were, were taking this bread and without knowledge. It, it's talking about me. I, I am the fulfillment of the Afikomen, okay? And so when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And, and we're going to do that this morning. And in the same way, he took the cup after they, had, after they had eaten. Again, after, right? This cup is poured out for... Uh, this cup which is poured out for you, mark it, is the new covenant. You might have the word testament in your translation. That my blood's going to be poured out for you, right? This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, verse 21, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is, is uh, going as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began discussing among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. Now, now you have to wonder what Judas's face looked like at this moment, right? I mean, this brother's got to be breaking out his very best poker face right here. Because we're told nobody has any idea who this is. What is Jesus doing by calling this out at this critical moment? Is Jesus doing kind of a drive-by guilting here? No, no. He is giving Judas, listen, he is giving Judas a chance to repent. He's letting him know, hey, dude, I know the score. I already know the score. I already know. So here's your chance to repent. Even as God, over and over again in the lives of you and I, puts before us multiple opportunities to repent. He already knows. Now, we know the story, and we know that Judas is not going to take that opportunity. And then we see the end that is produced by that, and that ought to be a real lesson for us. Now, the force of what we want to look at in these verses here is, again, this institution, this inauguration right here of the new covenant. Now, to understand the new covenant, we're going to go all the way back to Jeremiah 31. Understand that the new covenant was to be offered to the Jews first, right? But the, the, the new covenant was intended for the Jews, but they rejected it, which then made it effectual for the Gentiles, the church age. Go back and get that study if you missed it last week. Very important stuff to understand. Let's take a look at the new covenant defined uh, as it was originally intended in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now we're going to look at verses 31 through 34. I will give you a moment to get there, uh, Jeremiah, uh, after Psalms, after Proverbs, right after Isaiah, right? I'll grab your neighbor if you need a little help, but I'll give you a minute to get there. Jeremiah 31. Beginning in verse 31, we're going to read 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will write it, and I will be their God, and and they shall be my people. They will not teach again. They can teach themselves, right? They will not teach again. Each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. That is huge. They will all know me. Understand that. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. And here's the, here's the, oh man. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I just love this. And their sin I will remember no more ever again. Glorious. And what I want you to notice, I mean, look. I will put my law within them. I will write it. I will be their God. I will be uh, forgive their sin. Uh, notice this is God doing everything. Nowhere in this definition of the new covenant do we see man doing anything. None of this is predicated upon human ability. All that the people have to do to receive these unconditional promises is receive it. They shall be my people. What are the promises? Notice verse 33. A supernatural understanding of God's word. He will put the law within them and and upon their hearts. You try to read the Bible before you're a believer, man, man, that can get pretty tricky, right? I remember in my searching days back at Purdue, I was uh, canvassing all these world religions at the time. We're we're going back 25 years, but but I remember reading the Bible, and it was was like Russian to me, right? I I might as well have been reading Chinese. But man, when I came to the Lord, it it all just became uh, alive in my understanding. It it began to make sense to me, and man, I couldn't get enough. I'm telling you, I couldn't get enough those first couple of years that I talk about spiritual reflux, right? But, But hey, the Bible comes with tongues. Read the Psalms. But there is given to the believer a kind of supernatural intuitiveness to to begin to understand the Scriptures. Read 1 Corinthians 2. Read John chapter 3. You have received Christ. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling within you. He becomes your teacher. He becomes your teacher. Notice verse 34. They will not teach again. They will not teach again. Each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need teachers. That doesn't mean that God isn't raising up teachers. What is being expressed here is that every person can know the Lord. Every person can have the Holy Spirit as their teacher. Every person can understand. Now, now mark it there. Man, boldface this thing. They shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest. Now now dial into that right there. They shall all know me. You will have a personal relationship with the living God. Well, where does it just say that in the Bible? I I, I just always hear people talking about that. Right here. All right, it says it right here. They shall all know me. This is the new covenant. The veil is torn. Access to God is now given. They shall all know me. Praise God for that. Understand that you have the very same indwelling spirit within you that that a Charles Spurgeon or a, a Billy Graham has. From the least to the greatest, there are no superior people is why we don't boast. Ephesians 2. And of course, the granddaddy of them all there in verse 34, right? Complete, for, this just gives me a case of the happies, a, a complete forgiveness of all sins, uh, all sins washed away. And, and then the stunning part there, never to, re, to be remembered again. Man, if only you and I could forgive like that, right? And so that is the heart of the new covenant back there in the Old Testament. Now, back to Luke in verse 20 here. Let's get back to our text. Now let's look at this in the New Testament. We're going to cover both sides, all right? Verse 20, this word for covenant or testament in your translation, 
Uh, it's where we get, that word is where we get our word, last will and testament from. Okay? It means an arrangement made by one party for another party to receive. Now, when we die, uh, we have what we call our last will and testament. We understand this. There are four parts to a will. Right? Four parts. You have the testator, the person leaving the will. You have the heir, right? The person receiving the will. You have, of course, death, which is typically the event that triggers the will. And then, of course, you have the actual inheritance. Testator, heir, death, inheritance. Those are the four parts to a will. Now, if we take that grid, if we take those four parts of the will and testament, we take that grid and we lay it over the most popular verse in the Bible, John 3.16, what does it look like? Let's take a look. For God, he is the testator, right? So loved the world, that's you and I, the heirs, that he gave his only begotten son, gave by death, the event that triggers the inheritance, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's just leave that up for a minute. Now you look at this. This is the plan of salvation. This is what... Don't ever tire of this verse, man. Don't be inoculated by familiarity. This is what God... Again, this is what God had planned in mind before the foundation of earth for all of eternity. And and here, here is what I want to draw your attention to. Again, as we look very carefully at that, let us ask ourselves, what role, what part do I play in this? What is in here? I mean, what, where in here is there stuff for me to do? The only thing that I need to do is receive what God has done for me. John chapter 6, verse 29. They're coming up to the Lord. What works, plural, what must, what what do we got to do to get in? To, and Jesus says, no, no, no. The work, singular, is believe on him who has been sent. Delight in that. Salvation is not a byproduct of, of, of anything that you and I do or don't do. Salvation is what has been produced by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. John 19, Ephesians 2. And therefore, since that is true, as you and I gather to worship God, as, as we are out there in the world throughout the week, there is no basis in which you and I are to boast in anything. There is no basis upon which you and I should be be drawing any kind of attention to ourselves. And and there's no basis upon our thinking we are awesome. There's no basis in boasting in anything we have done. He has done it all. And that is the force of the new covenant that is now being initiated. I will, I will, I will, I will. You just receive it. Now, again, what these guys clearly do not understand, as we're about to see here, what these guys do not get now, one day will become very, very clear to them. The Holy Spirit will be poured out upon them, and they, might, they will be given understanding. I tell you what, man, read the book of Acts. These boys are going to become just beastly men of God. But, but where we are here... You cannot help, I suppose, to some degree, to marvel over their response to all of this. Understand, they have already been told, well, they've been told now, uh, arguably, at least on three occasions now, and and here is Christ, the meal is over, he has now given entire new meaning to the Passover protocol, and he has told these guys, look, guys, I'm going to suffer. I'm going, to, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to bleed. All right? My, my blood is going to be poured out for you in this new cup. I'm going to die here now, guys. And, and what now is their response? Well, notice finally here, verse 24. And there arose, and there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. Now, is this not just the height of insensitivity right here? Guys, I, I'm I, I'm gonna go down and I, 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 uh, which one of us is awesome? This just blows my mind. Uh, verse twenty-five. 
lesson time. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called, mark this, benefactors. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. Underline that word servant. That's the key word in all of that right there. Verse 27, for who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Mark the repetition. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you, verse 30, may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit upon thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, what he is telling them here is, look, guys, The church that I'm going to put you in charge of here, the church is not supposed to operate how the world operates. In the world, there is a kind of pecking order. In the world, in this culture, you have benefactors. Now, a benefactor is what a person in this culture would have been called that would have been in a position of honor or power with the expectation that everyone below them would look up to them, esteem them as better than themselves. Jesus is saying here, look, that is not how the church is supposed to run. The least among you, the the youngest among you, in other words, the least esteemed, right? He is saying, In the world, those in authority, those who are esteemed, those who are in positions of worldly honor, they are served by others. In the church, it is going to be you, the leaders yourself, who are going to be doing the serving. You, the leaders, you are to serve others. We are not to take the business model, the the organizational model that we find in the world that is not to be the model, that is not to be the grid that is to be laid over the church. In the church, leaders serve. That's what church leadership is. The Apostle Paul gives us the model for New Testament church leadership in 2 Corinthians 1. He says, look, we are not to lord authority over you, but rather we are to be, what? Helpers of your joy. helpers of your delight in Christ. Now remember what it is that just took place in in the uh, ceremonial portion of this Passover observance here. Just before the meal, Jesus grabbed the servant's towel, got up, walked around the table, and washed all of his disciples' stinky feet, and they were stinky. I mean, this culture, you, you, you were walking on the roads. They did not have the kind of sanitary conditions that we have in our day. So he grabs a towel, he goes and washes all these filthy feet. So they have just been given this tremendous object lesson by Christ, which no doubt would have made a tremendous impression upon them. And I believe this is the impression that the Lord would have to lay upon you and I this week, and this is where we're going to land the plane. Jesus said, Matthew 20, I came not to be served but to serve, to pour out my life for many. And if it is our desire to be like Jesus, if it is our desire to be transformed unto his image, if we are to be imitators of Christ, then that is to be our mindset as well. How can I pour out my life for many? Now, there's something I want you to notice very carefully here, and that is that Christ is not upset about the desire to be great. He is not upset about the desire to be great. You have to understand, man, God wants you to be great in the kingdom. Understand, there is nothing wrong with you having a desire to want to be great in the kingdom of God. We talked about this at our men's study, I don't know, a month or so ago, and some of the guys struggle with this a bit because we don't really have a category for this, right? We don't really have a category for godly ambition. Understand, godly ambition is good, prayerfully think this through and you'll understand the kinds of things that are going to make a person great in the kingdom of God are the kinds of things that are going to glorify him on this earth. 
Let me say that again. The kinds of things that are going to make a person great in the kingdom of God are the kinds of things that are going to glorify him on this earth. Listen, God wants you to have an abundant entrance into the kingdom. He wants you to shine as a bright star, 1 Corinthians 15, 41. What Christ is upset with here is how it was Not not that they were trying to attain greatness. What Christ is upset with is how they are trying to attain greatness. And they were trying to attain greatness by the way that greatness is recognized in the world. How many people do I have below me serving me? How many people am I above? How how many people are below me? Jesus is saying, no, no. How many people do you have above you? How many people are you serving? He turns it right on its head. Look, what does a servant, what does a servant do? A servant makes life easy for other people. That's what a servant does. A servant makes life easy for other people. You ask yourself this week, are are you making life easier for other people? Or are you making life harder for other people. Again, it's what I love about the gospel. I, I, I like to say this. It's not rocket science. We're not installing foam insulation on the space shuttle here. Being a servant is making life easy for other people. Now, we all have people in our sphere of family and friends, do we not? Uh, they just seem to make life a bit difficult. You can do nine things right, and they're going to jump all over the one that, that you're not so hot at, Right? You see a little poking going on out there. I mean, they are needy and grouchy and grumpy and crusty. These kinds of people, they are not going to be great in the kingdom of God. The people that are going to be great in the kingdom of God are going to be those people that you think to yourself, man, I, I am glad that person, so glad that person has come into my life. I, I am so thankful unto God that, that this person's life has, has just kind of brushed up against mine. This person has been such a, a source of delight and, and strength and, and encouragement to me. That person is going to be great in the kingdom of God. Look, you don't have to shake the world, all right? You don't have to win all of India to the saving knowledge of Christ to be great. All you have to do is be a person that, that comes alongside others and helps them and encourages them and speeds them along in their walk with Christ. God is saying to you and I this morning, look, ju- just be a good friend. Just be an encourager. Just be a good spouse. Are you making life easier for your wife? Are you making life easier for your husband? Watch the pokes. Can your friends say that their burdens have been lifted just a little bit because you have been brought into their life? This week, let's just worry about serving and and let's just leave the exalting up to the Lord. Let's worry about serving And let's leave the exalting up to the Lord, whom the Bible says um, he will do in due season. And notice where he ends up in verse 30, where we're going to end up. He's saying to these guys, look, I'm making a place for you in my kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table. Again, another reference to the great messianic banquet there in verse 30. How great is that day going to be? Can you imagine Paul says, no mind has has begun, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has begun to conceive. Oh, man, oh, that that day, how how amazing is that inauguration unto eternity going to be? That's one of the things that we do in communion. We not only look back, but we look forward to this great day when we will commune with the Lord in glory. And so uh, as the guys, guys, would you come forward? Uh, As the guys are passing out the elements, uh, I would like to invite the worship team back up here to the platform. And and as the guys are, are doing that, let's talk a little bit about what communion means to you and I today. Now, Uh, We typically tend to think of communion looking back, don't we? Our default um, kind of knee-jerk response to communion is that that we're looking back to something. We're we're looking back to to obedience and to what Christ said in the text and the Gospels. Do this unto remembrance to me. And that's absolutely a huge part of it. 
and, and the primary part of it, the preeminent part of it. Now, why did Christ ask us, you and I in our day, to do this in remembrance of me? Because it's so easy for you and I to forget, is it not? It's so easy for you and I to check off the list. As as shocking as it seems to sound, we can move away from the gospel. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus died for my sin. For for this I know, the Bible tells me so. Now, on to prophecy or or eschatology or or the spiritual gift, whatever. Okay, I've done that. I'm done with the gospel. Now I'm going to move on to all these kind of lofty, esoteric uh, ideas and, and directions. No, no, no. The Bible says the same gospel that saves you is the very same gospel that sanctifies you. It's the very same gospel that transforms you, that that grows you. We grow as we delight in the gospel. And so for a Christian, man, we we can never distance ourselves from the gospel. Uh, The degree to which we distance ourselves from the gospel is the degree to which we're not growing, and it's the degree to which we're not going to understand what the text is saying because the gospel is at the center of it all. And so let's continue to remember what brought us in this building this morning. Let's continue to remember this glorious forgiveness of sin for all time, past, present, future, never again remembered in the heart of our Heavenly Father. That is stunning. We should never take that for granted. We should always, always cherish the gospel, turn the gospel, look at it like a a beautiful diamond. What new angle, understanding, appreciation can can you have for the gospel? And and that's why we're here doing this week in and week out, is to turn the beauty of of just the the, the, uh, unsearchable riches of, of the gospel that we might get another glimpse and grow in our delight. And so we look back. We look back and, and, and we, are, we, we praise um, our Lord for, for what he has done for us. But that's not all. Because the text has also showed us we look forward, don't we? We look forward to sharing these elements with Christ once again at the Messianic banquet. He said, I shall not eat nor drink again until I am with you in my kingdom. So here he is, inaugurating, initiating this new covenant. And now here's this big time of space that we are in, the church age, and we're going to be with him again. So we're looking back, and we're looking forward. Oh, Lord, what you have done for us, never to be remembered, unspeakable, and yet as unspeakable is where all of this is going someday. So let's go ahead, if we, we're all ready, let's go ahead and, and take the bread together. Just in the quietness of your own heart, it's so special to share this um, with you as a family together in the quietness of your own heart just thank the Lord for what he has done spend a moment God thank you that you allowed yourself to be broken for us you allowed your body to be bruised and torn and battered that you might be our perfect high priest intimately familiar with all that we may go through in this life God thank you for breaking your body for us by your wounds we are healed let's take the cup together Lord, thank you that your shed blood was poured out for us. And we 
we take just a brief moment to thank you for salvation. Help us to never take that for granted, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for pursuing us. Would you magnify this week in our our minds and our hearts what you've done? Would would you draw us unto remembrance of of all that you've done? And and God, would you draw us unto remembrance of of where, why you've done all you've done and, and where this is all going? God, you are so good, infinitely good. Lord, I thank you for what you have brought to us in this text this morning. Pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, that we would go now and and seek to serve. And Lord, that we just show us the joy in that. You step out in that, and and you are going to find the joy of the Lord upon uh, your heart. Lord, Lord, help us with that. Help us to just go out and serve out of a heart of appreciation, not not because we have to to earn anything, because you've done it all for us, but help us, God, to walk in, in delight and in, in the abundance that you have for us. Thank you for this body of believers. Strengthen us unto you. And Lord, would you accept this worship that, that we bring forth as a, a just a pleasing aroma to your heart. We just desire to ravish your heart in, in this hour, Lord. Please, accept this. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. All right, let's worship together.